see Christ suffered willingly. Secondly, we'll see Christ suffered unjustly. And thirdly, we'll see Christ suffered completely. Obedient unto death. And first, Christ suffered willingly. Now, when we think of Christ's sufferings, we're thinking of the terrible things that he endured. Uh, Notice what verse 7 says. It says that, that he was oppressed. And that word oppressed, it means treated harshly. And how true this was to Christ, as, as we, we think about the Gospels and we think about how Jesus lived in his life, aren't these words true for him? That he was treated harshly. There we, we see the soldiers taking this purple robe and, and clothing Christ in, in mockery, putting this robe upon him. And then they take this crown of thorns and they set it upon his head and they press it down and they they hammer on it with the reed until the blood is pouring out. He was treated harshly. And then we see him mocked and spit upon and beaten. And then they strip him of this purple robe and they send him naked into the streets bearing his own cross until there we see the, the, the suffering servant bowing under the cross and, and not being able to take a step further. How applicable these words are. He was oppressed. And yet, as we think of Christ's suffering, we might be tempted to think of him as a helpless victim. We might think of him like, like Joseph, Children, you remember the story of Joseph. There he is. He goes and he looks for his brothers. They're feeding their sheep. And he goes out there to meet them and to to send greetings and, and to ask how they're doing. And as he goes, he goes blindly into the lion's den and they take him and they, they throw him in a pit and then they sell him off to, into Egypt. And there he's taken to, to the house of Potiphar and he's working as a servant, as a slave. And Potiphar's wife accuses him falsely. And then he goes even lower and he's sold into the, and he's sent into the prison. And there he, he deals kindly with the butler. And the butler forgets about him. And we find Joseph suffering like a victim time after time again. And, and our heart goes out to him. He, he seems helpless. Now, of course, we know that God has a purpose for Joseph in that story, but, but Joseph didn't know that as he's going through, through this, these trials wave after wave. He's, he's helpless. He would have chose a different path. And we're tempted to think of Christ in the same way, that he's this helpless victim that would have chose another path if he were willing, if he had the opportunity But if that's our view of Christ as a helpless victim, then we have a wrong understanding. Yes, Christ was was being brutally treated by the hands of wicked men. Yes, he was a victim in that sense, but he wasn't helpless. And this is the point that that Isaiah is is keen to set before us here in verse 7. This is the main point of verse 7 to show us that Jesus is suffering willingly. Notice what he says. He says, and he was afflicted. And this verb, it's, it has the reflexive idea, meaning he allowed himself to be afflicted. Christ submitted himself to this path of suffering. He handed himself over. He was, he was giving himself and his life over to, the, to this cruel treatment. This was his action, his will, his choice is behind this. And so as we think of Christ, we need to think of him as a volunteer. Christ was, was volunteering for this path of suffering. And this is crucial for us to grasp. Because, because here, when we're, when we're reading the sufferings of Christ, what we're finding is, is one who is stepping to the front of the volunteer line. One who is willfully taking on this path of suffering. And so back in eternity, when when the Father, Son, and and Spirit are planning the council of redemption, we find the Son asserting himself, stepping forward, gladly volunteering on this mission of suffering. And so Jesus isn't being caught here in the middle of a crossfire. He's not just, just wandering blindly into this suffering, being treated cruelly with, without him knowing this is going to happen. 
But he's purposefully, willfully putting his life on the line. He's entering into the battle intentionally. And so this is the main idea of verse 7. Christ suffered willingly. He was oppressed. He was afflicted. Yet he opened not his mouth. Isaiah is saying that the servant of the Lord will endure this suffering silently. He won't ob- object to the abuse that he's taking. He, he won't speak up for himself. Now children, if your parents start to speak to you and say things to you that, that you don't like to hear, things that they're requiring you to do that you don't like, the, the first thing that we often do is we object uh, we, we start to speak, we start to complain, we start to, to raise up our complaints, our, our objections. We open our mouth. And that's not what Jesus is doing here. Jesus keeps his mouth closed. He doesn't complain, he doesn't object, he doesn't speak up for himself. Instead, he is silent. And again, this is exactly what we see in the Gospels. There we are met with the eerie silence of Jesus in the midst of his suffering. Have you ever been struck by that? Have you you ever wondered, Jesus, why don't you speak up? There there he is, and and he's enduring all this, and and he's silent. I, I used to read these gospel accounts, and that would bother me as a kid. Jesus, why don't you speak up? Why don't you defend yourself? Why don't you do something? You're innocent. There he is, and, and, and he's in front of the high priest, and the high priest calls forth witnesses. And, and they're, they're, they're lying witnesses, they're false witnesses, and yet Jesus is silent. They, they, they're raising these lies, they're spreading the slander, and the high priest says, don't you have an answer? He point blank asks Jesus this question. And Matthew 26 tells us, Jesus remained silent. And then we go to Pontius Pilate, and there's Christ in front of Pilate. And Pilate is, is, is asking him question after question. And, and he's saying, don't you see all of these accusations that they're raising against you? Don't you know that I have the power to set you free? And Matthew 27, verse 14, tells us that Jesus gave him no answer, not even to a single charge, so that Pilate was greatly amazed. Christ's silence, it it rattled Pilate. He had never seen a condemned criminal dealing with these accusations in this way. His silence was an eerie silence. And the same thing is in front of Herod. There's Jesus. And Herod is looking to have some fun. He wants to see a miracle. And so he's asking him questions. He's prompting him. He's, He's tempting him. And Luke tells us that Jesus remains silent before Herod. Jesus opened not his mouth. This used to bother me. I used to see this as weakness. And yet, when we understand what what Jesus is doing, we recognize that this isn't weakness. That this ought not to bother the people of God. In fact, this ought to be precious for all who know the Lord Jesus as their Savior. Because when we see Christ here silent like a lamb, we see him being silent for my sake. We see that he is enduring this for me. He is silently submitting himself. He is silently enduring this great suffering on my behalf. Yes, I would have spoken up. I would have tried to defend my life. But not Jesus. Here he is, silent like the Lamb of God, going to be sacrificed on the altar for his people. And that's the picture Isaiah uses. He says he was led as a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep, before its shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. And so notice the imagery. The imagery is not of a lion. It's not of a lion snarling and tearing and swiping with his paws, trying viciously to defend his life to the last breath. But the picture is of a lamb, a silent, submissive lamb 
being brought to an offering. This word, the same word is used in Zephaniah 3.10 where it speaks of people bringing an offering to God. And here God is saying that my servant, he will be brought as a sacrificial lamb and he will go willingly on behalf of my people. And there's really two reasons why this is, a, is important for us. There's two reasons why we, we need to treasure and to see as precious the silence, the eerie silence of the suffering lamb. And the first is to see that we have sinned willingly. We have sinned willingly. We have purposefully gone astray. That's what Isaiah said in verse 6. To use the imagery of sheep to describe our sinful wanderings. We have purposely gone astray. We have willed. We have decided. We have chosen to go against the Lord. This was, was our path, our choice. We each have gone our own way to please ourself. We sinned willingly. And so if we are going to be saved... We need to have willful obedience, willful obedience rendered unto God. And we can't give that. It's impossible for us to give that as sinners. And so we need a willing, submissive substitute to stand in our place. And that means that all of the the lambs that were sacrificed throughout the Old Testament, they could never do because they were always brought to the slaughter in ignorance they went ignorantly. They, they went ignorant, ignorantly to the sacrifice. It wasn't their free choice. And yet here is one. This Lamb of God who comes and he volunteers. He goes willingly. This is what Philippians 2 verse 8 says. He says that he was obedient unto death. He was obedient unto death. That was his, his destination, death. That was his finish line. He lived his whole life in this this active obedience unto God, giving perfect obedience to the law in the place of his people. But that obedience didn't stop when he was in court before Pilate. It didn't stop when he was before Herod. It didn't even stop when he was on the cross. But he was obedient unto death. And so the picture that Paul is painting for us there is, is that we're to think of Jesus like like, like, a, like a sprinter who's running for the finish line. And he doesn't stop. He doesn't stumble before he crosses that line. But he goes with, with fullness, with energy, with obedience right to the very end. He, he blasts through that finish line with obedience. He goes right through death. And because he was obedient to the point of death, he can be obedient in our place. He is an obedient substitute. And therefore, he can stand in our place. But secondly, this is important for us because Christ's silence isn't weakness. It isn't weakness. Behind the silent, submissive lamb, we see the heart of a lion. We see the heart of of a lion. There is great strength here in Christ when he's silently enduring this suffering. There, here he is and he's in complete control, silently bearing the afflictions, the, the penalty of death that his people ought to suffer. Just think, just think, here is the almighty son of God. One word could have called down 12 legions out of heaven. If, if he just lashed out one word, 12 legions, Herod would have been dead. Pilate would have been dead. The mobs would have been dead. One thought could have brought down fire out of heaven and consumed them all. As Spurgeon says, Calvary could have become a volcano of God's wrath. Here is complete control in the Lamb as he willingly purposefully, intentionally goes and bears the suffering on behalf of his people. What strength we see in this submissive lamb. We see the heart of a lion as this lamb climbs himself, climbs onto the altar. He's the only lamb that ever did that, who willingly climbed up onto the altar and laid there 
bearing the wrath of God's judgment against sin. He suffered willingly. This takes us to our second point. He suffered unjustly. And we see that in verse 8, where Isaiah says he was taken from prison and from judgment. And the word for prison is literally, he was taken from oppression. And that word meaning violence committed against him. He was taken from oppression, from this violence. And, and judgment is, is a judicial term. It's, we're to think of a law court. And so these two terms, they really come together to present one idea in mind. Isaiah is, is seeing by the Spirit into the future, and he's saying that the servant of the Lord, he will come, and he will suffer violence, oppression, at the hands of a judicial court. That he will, he will have the legal system come against him with a vengeance. He will suffer unjustly at the hands of, the, of these earthly courts. And so Isaiah is saying that, that this servant of the Lord, he's not going to suffer in secret. He's not going to be taken behind a shed somewhere and, and, and beaten up by, by this, this goon of hooligans and murdered. No, he's going to be made a public scandal. He's going to be brought into a law court. And there he's going to be dealt with, he's going to deal with violence and oppression. He's going to deal with this public judicial procedure that condemns him to death unjustly. This is what Isaiah is seeing by the Spirit 700 years prior to the coming of Christ. And this is what we find in the Gospels. This is what we see as as we see Christ in the Gospels before, before the courts, before Pilate, before Herod, as the mobs are crying out against him, we see that, that Christ is made a public spectacle, that the courts of earth are, are raging against the courts of heaven as they take the Son of God and they condemn him to death. And we know that he is dealing with this judgment unjustly because Isaiah says in verse 9 that he has done no violence nor was any deceit in his mouth. And time and time again, Isaiah has made this point that this servant of the Lord is innocent. He's the obedient servant. And yet, he is suffering injustice against him. And Isaiah goes on and he says that the courts will will act in a decisive way against the servant of the Lord. Uh, Verse 8, Who will declare his generation? And that word declare, it's, it's the word for meditate. Who, who, will, who will ponder on? Who will contemplate his generation? And the idea being there, who will, who will think about his legacy? Who, who will take notice of, of his enduring legacy? Who will declare his generation? The, the idea is that, that, that he will die in obscurity. That he will die and people will think this is the end of him. Notice how Isaiah says, for he was cut off from the land of the living. And that word cut off, it means to be, to be hacked down like a tree. He, he is violently separated from the land of the living. And again, we see this in the Gospels where, where Christ is, is, is brought to the courts and, and he's, he's put on trial and they, they condemn him to death and they bring him to, this, to the cruelest death that they can think of, the crucifixion on the cross. And there as he's hanging on the tree, no one is thinking about his enduring legacy. They think this is the end of him. Just imagine you were there. And you, see, and you walk by the cross and you see this, this bloody, battered man hanging on a cross. He's 33 years old. He doesn't have a wife. He doesn't have kids. He has a few scattered followers that have forsaken him. Would you contemplate his legacy? That is, would you think that, that there is a story behind, beyond this point for him? No. We, we would think that this is the end. This is, this is just another criminal dying on a cross. End of story. That's the idea that Isaiah is presenting for us. Who will declare his generation? For he was cut off from the land of the living. 
Well, this is the humiliation Christ stooped to. We've all suffered injustice in our lives on various levels and different degrees. Maybe you know the pain of being slandered. You know the, the, the pain of being stabbed in the back by, by close people, maybe friends or family even. And yet none of us have come close to the depths of what Christ endured, of how harshly, how unjustly he was treated. And so the question is, well, what makes sense of this? Why is, why is the sinless Son of God suffering such injustice? Have you thought about that question? Have you stopped long enough to, to ponder why would God suffer such injustice at the hands of sinners? Have you stopped to, to think, what, what's, what's behind this? Have you paused as, as God has maybe pressed pause on your life in this time of, of uncertainty, in this, this time of, of this virus happening? Have you, have you paused to consider this most important question? Why is God willing to endure such injustice by the hands of sinners? Do you have an answer for that? My friend, Isaiah has an answer. And it's an answer that he keeps bringing up. And it's the answer we find at the end of verse 8. For the transgressions of my people, he was stricken. This is the answer that keeps bubbling to the surface. Substitution. He for me. This is why. This is why Jesus remained silent in front of the courts. This is why Jesus was obedient to the point of death. This is why Jesus descended so low walking on this road of shame, why he willfully chose this path, it's because of the depths of his love. That's the answer we need to come to as we contemplate the sufferings of Christ. Why would God go so low for sinners? Well, we won't find an answer for that question. But the fact that he does, the fact that he does, that's the clear message of the gospel that he was cut off by sinners and that he did this for sinners. Have you dealt with the gospel of Jesus Christ? Won't you take time? Won't you take time in, in this weird season in your life when everything else is, is put on pause, won't you take time to contemplate the depths and the willingness of Christ to suffer such injustice? Well, Jesus suffered willingly. He suffered unjustly. But finally, Jesus suffered completely. And that's what we see in verse 9. And here we see an amazing prophecy. Because it's here that, that Isaiah adds unexpected detail that only the Spirit of God could give to this prophet. And these are details about Christ's burial. Notice what he says. And they made his grave with the wicked, but with the rich at his death. And this term here, made, is, is the, the term for appointed. They appointed his grave with the wicked. They, they set out his burial plot to be with the wicked. And this is exactly what, what we find in the Gospels. There are the crowds and the leaders, and they're chanting, crucify him crucify him. And in doing so, they are appointing his grave with the wicked. Because in these days, when, a, when, when someone was crucified on the cross, they were dying the death of the worst criminal. And those criminals, were, after they were dead, they were taken off the cross and they were just thrown in a heap in a common criminal grave. They were, were buried in a pile together. And so they appointed his grave with the wicked. And that word for wicked is in the plural, with many wicked. He is, he is being appointed. They're setting out, they're marking out his grave to be with the wicked, with the low lives in, in society, with those who, who no one cared for. 
This is what it looks like the destiny of the servant is going to be. Everything is in motion. He's, he's at the trial. He's condemned. He's, he's sent to the cross. He's nailed there. He's dying on the cross. The next step is that his grave will be with the wicked, with, that, that, with all of the criminals and that common criminal burial. And yet Isaiah adds these words, but, but, and he taps the brakes, but, the story isn't finished, but he will be buried with the rich. He will be with the rich in his death. And there the word rich is singular. He will be with the rich, one man, singular, in his death. And so this is remarkable because the only thing Isaiah doesn't tell us is the rich man's name, Joseph of Arimathea. We have to go to the Gospels to figure that out. But he tells us everything out. He, he spells out in detail the, the, the death that Christ is going to die is one of a shameful death that looks like he will be buried with the wicked and yet in the last moment he will be buried with the rich. And so that's what we find That's what we find in in the Gospels as well. And as we hear this, we need to see that the burial is actually another step in Christ's humiliation. Yes, Christ isn't buried with, with the common criminals, but he's buried in a borrowed tomb. And that is great humiliation. Because here is the King of Kings, the owner of everything, the Lord of lords, and he doesn't even possess his own burial plot. He's buried in a borrowed tomb. You read this in John 19, verse 31 to 42, where Pilate permits Joseph to take his body and and he lays Jesus' body somewhat unthinkingly into his tomb because the Sabbath is coming and he doesn't know where else to lay his, his his dead Messiah. And so he just, he puts him in his own tomb. And yet this is all according to God's purposes and fulfillment of this prophecy. And yet what humility we see here. Christ, the son of God, not owning even his own grave. And the burial of Christ is important for us because it tells us that Christ suffered completely. He suffered completely. He was obedient unto death. He was the sprinter who made it to the finish line. He busted through the the finish tape with with full energy, with full steam. He made it unto death in obedience. He, He suffered and he died and he was buried. There's finality here. We know for certain he that he actually died. He actually accomplished what he set out to do. And so there's relief for us. This this substitute, he didn't stop short of the finish line, but he actually took the baton and carried it over the finish line for us. He suffered completely and therefore ensured the victory on behalf of his people. Child of God, what, what a savior we see here this morning. One who suffers, who suffers willingly, one who suffers unjustly, and one who suffers completely. Well, I want to leave us this morning thinking of a few final applications. And the first is that Christ must be my redeemer. Christ, my redeemer. Here is the one and only representative who has actually given willful, perfect obedience unto God and who died in the sinner's place, bearing the wrath of God. Christ is the only redeemer, and is he your redeemer? Can you say these words, Christ, my redeemer? Is that your confession? Is that your hope? That as you look at at the suffering servant, there you see your redeemer, the one who sets you free from sin, the one who sets you free from God's wrath, the one who's, who's, who's set you free from what you've deserved. Christ, my Redeemer. What precious words those are. What, what words that ought to fill your heart with joy. These words ought to lead you into singing, Christ, my Redeemer, precious Redeemer, one who was so willing to go so low, This is my Savior. This is my Redeemer. Is that your confession? 
Well, if it is, then Christ is not only your redeemer, but Christ must also be your example. Christ, my redeemer, and Christ, my example. We cannot reverse the order of these things. We cannot seek to make Christ my example first, trying to imitate him in order to earn favor with God. We can't do that. If we go down that path, it leads to death. But if we follow this order, yes, first, Christ my Redeemer, the one who makes me accepted with the Father, then Christ also must be my example. I can't separate the two. I can't take the one without the other. The New Testament doesn't allow us to take only Christ as my Redeemer without Christ as my example. In fact, this is Paul's major point in Philippians 2. There in Philippians 2, we find Paul, and he's, yes, discussing Christ's humiliation. And he's discussing the exaltation that Christ will enjoy in verses 6 through 11. But what sets up Paul's whole discussion of the depths of Christ's humiliation is the fact that we are to have the same mind of Christ. Notice that. Notice that Philippians 2.5 sets up this whole passage. There, Philippians 2.5, Paul says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. And then he unfolds, Jesus being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a servant and coming in the likeness of men and being found in appearance as man. He humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. And so Paul is saying, let this mind be in you. Have a humble mind. And let me flesh out what that looks like. See Jesus. See him suffering. See him willingly going to the point of death in humility. And so this is our pattern. This is our example Christ is our pattern. How are you doing? Father, mother, child, how how are you doing as as you seek to, to care for others, to serve others? Jesus became a servant and he was obedient to the point of death. This is our pattern. This is our example. Are we following his lead? That's the point of Philippians 2. And that's the point also that Peter makes in 1 Peter 2. And there Peter makes a similar application. 1 Peter 2, verse 21. For to this you were called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example, that you should follow his steps. And then he quotes our text, Isaiah 53, verse 9, who committed no sin, nor was deceit found in his his mouth. And so Peter says, this is commendable for us, that if we are suffering, we ought to do so submissively, giving ourselves over to the hand of God, entrusting ourselves unto God's hand, recognizing that he is in control, and that the Lord has called us to walk in the steps of our suffering Savior. And how applicable this is for us in these days, where suffering might very well be on our path. These days when we might have to give up comforts. The question is, how are we going to bear that? How are we going to endure this suffering? Are we going to follow Christ's example? Are we going to go and have this lamb-like spirit? To have this humble submission, recognizing that we are committing ourselves to our Father, who cares for us, who knows that all things, who, who know all things are in his hands, and so we can deal with the suffering that he brings to our path. Jesus, my Redeemer, is also Jesus, my example. He suffered like a lamb. He suffered like a lamb. Our lion of the tribe of Judah, he lived and died like a lamb. He is our redeemer and he is our example. May God help us as we seek to follow him in the days ahead. Amen.